Hi, this is Paul Casey, the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame, educational video series. We'll be discussing today and reflections of Senior Grandmaster Edwin Kealoa Parker. We'll have personal interviews with some of his closest instructors discussing their life with Ed Parker. I hope you enjoy this as we pay tribute to the founder of American Kempo. Hi, this is Paul Casey, Campo Karate Hall of Fame. Today, we will reflect on Senior Grandmaster Parker, founder of American Campo. Today's special guest, Senior Master of the Arts, Mr. Joe Deming. Hello, Joe. Welcome. How you doing, Mr. Casey? It's good to have you here. I am going to uh, ask you some questions on Mr. Parker. Mr. Dimmick, what was the greatest inspirational lesson you ever learned from Ed Parker? Uh, he inspired me with primarily his knowledge and his incredible speed that he had. Until you have him work on you with what he could do and controlled, um, it blows your mind. I was, he says, well, you, all right, let's, he says, all right. So try to punch, try to punch me. And I said, well, I wouldn't punch my teacher. He says, well, go ahead and give it a try. <laughs> so anyhow, um, you know, I, I made a half hearted I mean, I didn't want to, it's just, it's, it's like disrespect for me. And um, so, but anyway, so I did something and he went, and I, and I was, touched me all kinds of places and I went, well, I hurt in a lot of spots here. He said, oh, Joseph, that was just lightweight. I didn't, I didn't really try to hit you hard. And I said, well, I'm so glad of that. And uh, he was always had a good sense of humor. Uh, I enjoyed all the lessons I got to have with him because eventually when I had the Downey studio and the Fountain Valley studio and so on, I couldn't really uh, attend the uh, evening classes. So I would take a two hour private lesson uh, every um, uh, Friday morning at his, at his house. And so uh, sometimes he would say, come to the studio, but most of the time it would be, uh, come to, you know, come to my house. I was always at his house, more, normally. Sometimes he'd say, no, come to the studio. I said, okay. And um, they would say where I should be, where not to be. And then uh, I made sure I didn't give him any, uh, I just said, yes, sir, I'll be there. So, uh, but he was, uh, had a nice, soul and a, and a kind interior he was all business as well but you know you don't run all this association by just kind of being uh, milk and toast it's a lot of work and there's a lot of people sometimes people need to have a, a discussion with him and uh and of course i never had one of those because i knew better and so do you remember uh, your last conversation with ed parker it was on the telephone and um, he sounded very serious. Uh, he says, well, listen, uh, I think he was like rescheduling a lesson. I can't really call it precisely. And I said, anything you want to do, Mr. Parker, whatever it, is, whatever it is. So he always ended up making things up though. And, and, um, for the, for the lessons, so I never got left out. But that's why I said I paid for uh, to get two hours of his time because I knew between the phone calls and the book deals and all this stuff, he was a busy, busy guy. And so just to even get lessons from Mr. Parker, that's uh, quite a quite a nice thing for me. Let's go to one last question. You are a very spiritual man, a very humble man. You've been in the martial arts a long time. You have, people have great respect for you because you let your 
actions on the mat speak. And you're, you're great. You, you choose your words carefully because they mean a lot to you. So I'm going to give you a hypothetical. It's been 30 years since Ed Parker passed away. 30 years. December 15th. Can't believe it. Tragic, tragic day. I remember it clearly because I got the phone call. I was in Japan uh, and Frank Trejo called me. And I was supposed to come home just after the first of the year. And uh, so there's a lot more to that story, but that's not about me. It's about you. And uh, so we're going to take a moment. Your, room, your, your school right there has great tribute to Ed Parker and, and the things you've accomplished and whatnot. You had a very good relationship with Mr. Parker. It's obvious. Ed Parker is told, Ed Parker is told by the big guy, you just have a few minutes. Go spend it with Joe Demick. Mr. Parker walks into your school where you're at right now. He sits down across from you, sir. Tell Mr. Parker what you would feel if you were to see him. I'd be totally overcome because obviously the situation, it's almost like he's reappearing from, from being out of this world. And, but he was just always so impressive. You're in the presence of a great teacher keep your mouth shut and start learning something. So we always had a real easy rapport. Well, as far as it goes, I always was a huge fan of Mr. Parker and his family. And him as a teacher was amazing. Um, one thing he'd always say to me though, he said, look, say, Joe, remember, they all quit. And in the end, they all quit so i told myself well i'm never going to quit unless i kick the bucket or something and i'm still going and um it's uh unfortunately mr parker's life and his heart um quit on him darn it because we we miss him big time yep so that's some thoughts that I have on this. And, um, you know, look, I was just lucky and I miss him a lot. I miss Mr. Parker. My goodness, you, you know the story. It touches your heart. So I, um, yeah, I really am so happy that you're doing this, these interviews, not with me, but in general, so that people can kind of get an insight into what Mr. Parker was really all about. <laughs> it's just something different in my life, knowing that he's gone, but his presence, his presence is always here with me. Yeah. Very cool stuff. Sir? Yes. Thank you for never quitting. I'm still growing. Uh, I just have to talk my uh, my uh, all those body parts to stay stay working because I'm really enjoying my life right now a lot. I really am. Yeah. God bless you, Joseph. Thank you so much. I wish you the very best for the holidays with you, with your wife, with your students, the extended family. And on behalf of the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame, you're amazing, and I appreciate your time. And I thank you for your time. And uh, onward up. Real quick. Hi, this is Paul Casey. And right now we have special guest, Senior Grandmaster of the Arts, Dave Hebler, one of Mr. Parker's first black belts. And we are honored to have you today with us, Mr. Hebler. Welcome. Thank you, Paul. It's an honor to be here. Dave, you've been with Mr. Parker since the early, what, the late 50s, early 60s? Yeah, the late 50s, 1959. Can you remember how you first met Mr. Parker? Uh, yeah, I, um, it was in the year, um, um, 
Well, I'll give you a little background. I, I, I was training with some Hawaiian folks in my squadron in the Air Force. I was stationed at March Air Force Base. I was getting out of the Air Force in 1959 to attend college at Pasadena City College. And um, they were aware of that. So they said to me, uh, when you're done registering uh, at Pasadena City College, drive up the street two blocks and you'll see Ed Parker's Kempo Karate School. And when it comes to Kempo, Ed Parker is the man. So you need to go see him. So I did. I walked in the studio. Uh, Ed was there alone. He was the only one there. And uh, we started uh, chatting and talking. Uh, and he, he said, come with me. He took me out on the mats. Uh, and he demonstrated some moves for me. And I was astounded, really. I mean, it was like I got hit in the head with a sledgehammer. I had never seen another human being move like that man moved. And I knew right, I knew right then and there, I wanted to learn how to do that. I wanted to move like Ed Parker. Can you tell us a little bit about when you finally became a black belt under Ed Parker? Yeah. You know, um, he really didn't do formal testing back in those days. He basically just awarded you the rank when he felt that you had earned and deserved the rank. So I received a phone call at home and he said, come on over to the studio, I need to see you. Bring your, bring your gig. So I said, okay, and I did. I went over there and he said, all right, get, uh, get suited up. I did, I came back out and he said, all right, kneel down. And um, he right then and there promoted me to black belt. And I didn't want to take it because it was the same color as his belt, you know? And um, he said something that, that stuck with me. He said, it's not your decision, it's my decision. I decide when you're a black belt and I've decided you're a black belt. And that was it, that was the promotion. Can you tell us the greatest lesson you ever learned from Ed Parker? The greatest lesson I learned was um, how to adapt the material to my own physical makeup and my own mental outlook and create Dave Hebler's Kempo Karate. Um, and I thought that was an important aspect of Kempo uh, in particular, because um, the development of the individual, to me, is the single most important part of training. You know, I don't want to be a, a copy of somebody else, because if you're a copy of somebody else, you're never number one. You're always number two. So I wanted to be the best me that I possibly could be. And his teaching and his, uh, uh, his thought process um, was, a, was an integral part of all of that. What do you think is Mr. Parker's greatest inspiration or legacy he has left on the martial arts community? He was able to motivate people to want to excel. Uh, he was the consummate instructor. Uh, he was patient. I mean, he would, uh, he would demonstrate a move that he wanted you to do. Uh, and uh, you'd, be, uh, you'd be stumbling all over the place trying to do the move. And uh, I mean, most of us know that Ed Parker, um, he really loved those rising forearm strikes. You know, and he was showing me his technique and he had that strike in there. And I said, you know, hey, that's fine for you. You know, it doesn't work that well for me. And he went, no problem. We'll change it to this for you. So uh, we made the adjustment so that I could do the move in a manner that I was capable of doing.
never said, um, be like me. He never said that. Um, he always wanted you to be the very best that you could possibly be. And he made that evident so that all of his students recognized that. And we knew he was genuine. We knew he was real. All right. And that was uh, an amazing, an amazing experience in my life. One of the highlights of my life. You know, my God, I've been involved for 62 years. And I'm still, I'm still doing it. In your opinion, in all the years that you knew Mr. Parker and now looking at martial arts, and especially Kempo in the state it is of today, how do you think Mr. Parker would like to be remembered? I like he, I think he would be, uh, like to be remembered by the body and the quality of the students that went through his system. Not just the people that trained directly with him, but the people that trained with the people under him and on and on and on through the generations. He wanted his art to live. He wanted his art to thrive. And he wanted his art to change with the times. Uh, and he always said that. Change is important. And the more you change, the better you are. And then, you know, that kind of thing. I, I, I'm sure I'm not quoting him exactly, uh, but hopefully you'll get the idea. Uh, and he really meant that. Take what I teach you, adapt it to your own personal physical makeup and your mental, you know, outlook and create your own Kempo system. So I don't have any quarrel with people who think otherwise. That's their, that's their prerogative. I don't know. I'm just telling you mine. <laughs> I have, uh, one, uh, I, I'm going to add something here. If yeah. he was right here to walk into that room, in your room, and you could have a conversation with him for just a minute or two before he had to leave, and I'm talking he spiritually came into the room, and sat down and said, hello, Dave, how are you? What would you say to Mr. Parker today? Oh, I don't know. Hello, my old friend. Thank you for all that you have done for me. And uh, all I've become, whatever that may happen to be in life, I owe you a great deal of gratitude for wherever I am in this life today. And uh, I'll see you soon. Casey, this is for you. Uh, Ed Parker has meant a lot to me in my life. Uh, Ed Parker for me is a father figure. For Bruce Lee, uh, although I was older than Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee was more of an older brother figure. But for Ed Parker, he's always been my father figure. He was the one that introduced me to Bruce Lee. Uh, he made me uh, thirst for knowledge. He talked about other styles with me. And in, in my time, private time with him, he always talked about different styles, which had my interest in learning other styles because of Mr. Parker. And Mr. Parker, of course, as you know, had a boxing background, he had a judo background, and I think that's what made his Kempo unique. Plus, he had the, 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 the training from Kempo, from the Chows. But uh, I think with Mr. Parker, he's definitely been my father figure. He's a, a man that's 
really, I really owe a lot to you. I remember when I was very broke as a school teachers. In those days, teachers used to only get paid for uh, 10 months. So they had to find a job during the last two months of the summer and then before they can start working again in September. But I didn't have a place to stay, and uh, Mr. Parker was really nice enough to let me stay at the Kempo Karate Studio in what we call the, uh, the Santa Monica area or the Wilshire area until I could get back to teaching again uh, in September as a school teacher. So I really cherished the time he let me stay at the Kempo Karate Studios and in the what we called at that time the Santa Monica area. But I think what uh, I liked about Mr. Parker, he definitely always caused me to research and look at. Uh, even when I trained with different systems, you know, uh, that was part of my research because Mr. Parker had studied under many different Chinese systems and he, sometimes he would show me things he learned from the San Francisco area in, in Choi Li Fat or Hunga or, or Choi Li Fat. So I liked that part of him that uh, he allowed me to research and still teach for him and train in, at the Kempo studio both in the Santa Monica area and in the Pasadena area. But definitely uh, I miss him. I think the Lord took him a little bit away too early from us and uh, I always treasure the time I spend with Mr. Parker. Uh, had some of the nicest instructors that Mr. Parker teach me from uh, Chuck Sullivan to Dave Heber. That I cherished a lot and uh, he was always giving so giving in, in his knowledge and I remember those days, I, I treasure those days and they will be long in my memories and uh, I love him, I really love the man. demo at a junior high school and we're doing what you call thundering hammers bam and i got him on the neck and i got him just right at the base of the skull top of the spine and he told me later on he said his legs wobbled he said i almost went down on my face and i said my god i didn't even feel it i didn't even feel it but i got him just right and that just shows you if you went for it really went for it my god somebody just go boom i mean they were oh, holy mackerel yeah, he told me, he said, I was, he said, I was seeing the, the little stars. And he said, and then finally, he said, you know, he came, he came back quick because I didn't, I didn't really lay it in. I just barely, Paul, I didn't even feel it. That's kind of scary. Well, thank you, of course. Thank you, Ed Parker, for what you've given me and what you've given the world because it spread from that one man into hundreds of thousands today. And I, I, I miss him. Um, we had, like I said, at one point there, uh, because I was the only guy that stayed when everybody else left, um, I had a special place with him. That nobody else could have had and uh until until time and distance finally drew us into other areas of, of life uh there was a, a a few years there where literally we were each other's best friend and we talked almost daily on the phone if we weren't together and we spent many more hours together than we probably should have just because i wouldn't leave <laughs> i'd be at his house and we'd be working when we when we shot those eight millimeter films i mean getting the whole business up and running took a lot of time and uh, I cherished that time. He was my best friend for quite a long time. And the only regret I have is that distance and time did separate us into other areas. I should never have started the karate school that I did. I should have stayed closer to him, but then I wouldn't even know you because everything changes. If one day in your life changes, 
today would have been changed. So I wouldn't give up what I have today for anything either. Thank you. Hi, this is Paul Casey, the Campbell Body Hall of Fame educational video series, and we are discussing reflections of the senior grandmaster Ed Parker, the founder of American Kempo, one of the most influential men in the modern history of the martial arts. Not only did he create American Kempo based upon his learning and teachings in Hawaii and through the teachers that he met there, but he refined it for the Western culture. He introduced it to America, and because of that, he created not only a system of modern fighting, but also a system for the thinking man, creating the world's greatest martial arts tournament, the International Cry Championships. When he saw talent, he recognized it, and he made sure that that talent was recognized. Today, we are honored by one of the most humblest, human beings I have met, a very talented man in his own right, in the martial arts for over 50 years, a senior master of the arts, a student of Ed Parker to the days when Mr. Parker was here to the present. Mr. White is considered to be one of the finest, and we welcome him to the Campbell Karate Hall of Fame to talk about his teacher, his friend, Edmund Kialoa Parker. Hello, Mr. White. Welcome. I'll do it. Thank you very much. It's certainly an honor to be able to talk about somebody I have so much respect for. Mr. White, we're going to ask a couple of questions to you right now and uh, reach inside and give us the best you can, because that's the only way you do things. What was the most inspirational lesson you ever learned from Ed Parker? Well, I think that the ability to make people around him feel like they were the only people in the room. He had, was so charismatic. He just uh, had this unbelievable people skills that people just, I think, gravitated toward him because he had so many different aspects of his personality. But the one thing that he did do consistently is he had this ability to remember people's names, that to make them feel welcome, make them feel important. Um, just uh, some people skills that I didn't necessarily grow up with, but I saw a great example of how to treat people, and he certainly had that. You know, he just had this presence. I, I always talk about uh, if 50 people were in a room, you knew where Ed Parker, you might not even know Ed Parker, but you knew immediately that this person was somebody that that's kind of stood tall above everybody else. Can you share a personal story of your relationship with Mr. Parker, but not on the mat? Something that reflected his sense of humor? Yeah, you know, he did have a, a tremendous sense of humor. He loved to laugh. He loved to, to uh, joke around. And, you know, we spent... Uh, not a lot of time away from the studio, even though I did spend some very memorable times at his house or in Miami. We went there to promote the Karate Kid movie, and he came out and was actually sewing patches on our competitors' uniforms so we could go and represent uh, him at the tournament the next day. And um, I just know a lot of people will make comments about Mr. Parker not being – competitive and I go that's a side of him that I didn't see I think he was very competitive uh, if, if you don't think he was competitive you haven't driven with him because he certainly would uh, be out there and um, he hate to see people cut him off or try to get to a location before he did you know so he had that side and I think uh, that's one thing I, I kind of recognized early you know he was uh, somebody that was obviously very comfortable with himself, but he always instilled in me the desire to be better. 
And, you know, that's something that uh, I had the pleasure of competing in front of him uh, numerous times, and it always made me want to uh, excel. You know, you always have the will to win, but there's also parts that you could reach in and pull out uh, when you need to. And when he was around, you needed to, because I wanted him to be proud of me representing uh, the IKKA and, and wearing his patch and uh, I just didn't want to lose wearing that patch. So I went, did but my best effort to not. Do you remember the last time you saw him? A couple of months after the internationals, internationals, eight months. So probably in about October, you know, we would go up and um, get patches for, for the year, try to do it once or twice a year and get enough patches to uh, keep all of our people uh, wearing them while we were competing. So I would say it was probably October, a couple months before he passed. Do you remember any conversations with him? Well, many conversations, not necessarily that particular one. I, I do remember um, leaving and then he was telling some, some joke uh, on the way out the door. Cause you know, I used to love and to go up there after somebody, I just posted this recently we would have a belt test and if his schedule didn't allow him to attend, I used to love to take new black belts up there and set him on the bench or his couch. And then I would try to get on the other side. So I had a good view and you know how animated he was. He was always grabbing people and doing hyper extensions with lone kimono, putting his fingers in their eyes and they're sitting there in awe because it's Ed Parker and could, could hardly move. Uh, and, so, you know, those trips were something that I'll always remember. And, and my black belts now, when we talk about it, it's something that were special moments that uh, we both cherish. Well, I would just thank him. I would thank him for the quality of my life. What I've been able to do for a living for 50 years is all a direct result of his influence and education that he gave to me. And I could never repay or thank him enough for giving me this opportunity that uh, I so embrace, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up soon. And this idea uh, of giving thanks is something that I do often to him in our prayer. Uh, and I have no idea what course my life would have taken without the time that I was able to spend with him and the education he provided for us. He taught me how to teach. He taught me how to communicate with people, how to treat people, how to, not just the physical part, karate is a wonderful thing, but the people skills that he gave to us, that not just to me, but to so many of us, the influence on how to convey a message properly, the advantages of education, the vocabulary, uh, how to be articulate. You know, Ed Parker could talk to presidents of countries and he could talk pigeon with his friends from Hawaii. He just had that ability to make everybody feel important. And those are all things that I've tried to learn from him. There'll never be another Ed Parker in my opinion, but we could always try to improve and try to be uh, the best person we could be. And he taught us that. And I think he emphasized that, you know, he taught, thinkers and he taught individuals he didn't want anybody cloned he didn't want everybody to be like him exactly but we all take have part of him we all have part of him every time we walk on the mat it's a direct result of him you're a god-fearing man you know who your maker is mr parker was very devout in his religious beliefs If Ed Parker were to walk into your office right now, because he had a few minutes, he was given that opportunity to spend with you. What would you say to Ed Parker? Mr. Parker, I'd like to tell you and express to you from the bottom of my heart, the gratitude that I have to you through your education that you gave to us. You've given me an opportunity to do and have a wonderful career for 50 years. There's not one thing I would do differently other than I'm glad I have this opportunity to express to you 
how much you mean to me and how fortunate I believe I am because of what you've done for me. I truly thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. That was beautiful. Hi, this is Paul Casey, Kempo Karate Hall of Fame. Today we will be reflecting on the memories of the senior grandmaster, Edmund Kialoa Parker, founder of the American Kempo Karate. Uh, and today I'm very lucky to have with us one of Mr. Parker's students, senior master of the arts, Dennis Knatzer. Hello, Dennis. Greetings. How are you? Mr. Knatzer. What is the greatest lesson you ever received from Ed Parker? Oh, geez. Um, you know, the greatest, uh, the greatest time was actually being accepted as a student. Uh, you know, that was probably my greatest uh, time as far as that goes. I, I, I think the greatest lesson was to, you know, be specific and, you know, study, you know, from all angles and and you know look look at three points of view. I think that was probably a, a, a real profound you know start was when when you're looking at anything and you're studying anything, look at it from three points of view. Don't just look at it from a limited perspective. Try to look at you know the the broader picture. And uh, that's with with Kempo, or it's with life too. So uh, it can really it can really be added to a number of things. So uh, his, his sense of of, uh, of uh, uh, comedic rise and, and uh, you know things like that. He was he was uh, very uh, a pe very much a people person, and uh, that kind of fit my personality as well. But but I think uh, you know just uh, looking at things from more points of view, three points of view was probably a very important thing because that gives you a perspective that a lot of people don't um, don't look at. They look at limited perspectives at times. What is Mr. Parker's greatest accomplishment in your opinion? Uh, I, I, I think his greatest accomplishment was putting together a, an extremely organized system to, for those that are willing to look at it and actually study it, um, can, can carry them through life. It's not only Kempo lessons, but it's a life lesson as well. So a lot of the material is, uh, you know, multifaceted, not, not just defense, oriented or, or fighting oriented but also you know being a uh, a good person in life and to help other people and to uh, you know to share uh, your knowledge with people mr. Parker walks into your room right now said I miss you and let me tell you that I'm obligated and I'm thankful for what you've given me uh, and I'm going to share and, and continue your legacy the best I can to let people know who the founder of American Kempo really is, and that's you, the one and only. Uh, as one statement that I remember that you said, Ms. Zena Kempo, is a man's greatness is depends on how long his name fares from the grave. And your name in my book and in many others is are going is going to go to our eternity, to, to we are here no more. And, uh, you know, just to let you know that we're still keeping the flame burning and we're still doing exactly what you wanted, or at least trying to. And uh, we miss you and we wish you were here. We all love you. Paul Casey, 
Kempo Karate Hall of Fame. And we are reflecting on Senior Grandmaster Ed Parker. Today's special guest is Mr. Gil Hibben. And we're going to talk to Gil right now. Hello, Gil. Hey, good to see you guys. It is wonderful to have you here. What is the greatest inspiration you received from Ed Parker? To be myself. And he said, you know, stay with your art. Um, he had a lot of guys who could do karate. And I was, I, I thought pretty, I was averagely a good guy, you know, for a short guy. But uh, what he told me is, you know, stay with your, with your art. And that was the best thing he ever gave me. Stay, stay right there and, and keep making knives. And that is your art. Yes, it is. <laughs> You're the legendary Gil Hibben of Hibben Knives. You've done so many incredible things. Tell us briefly how you created the Parker knife. Well, this was, uh, it was uh, with making knives. Uh, Mills Crenshaw was my instructor at that time. And he gave me some, some points, but uh, to, uh, to make knives, to make it just a certain way. It's a, uh, I, Mills helped me, but it was one thing that it evolved and evolved and evolved and it got better and better and better to finally got to really like it. And he was really happy with that. I was over Mr. Parker's house and the first thing he did showed me your knife. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> I said, I hope you're going to use this to cut the bird or are you just showing it for display or is there some more to it? <laughs> not me if Mr. Parker were to walk into the room right now with you and your son and sit down with you for five minutes what would you say to him well I guess the first thing I would ever say is that uh, I, that I loved him I uh, he was just a friend I mean more than than just being in karate and stuff. We became great friends. So it was uh, to, to be together, to, to, to do it again. I mean, to be together. Wow, what could you say? It would be, um, I, I just, uh, I just have to say that I, I loved him. Yeah, loved him. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you, Mr. Hibben. I really appreciate it. That was beautiful. You and you're just good human beings. You're, you're what a senior should be. And we need to learn more from you. Thank you, man. Thank you. God bless you. Okay, Wes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we love you. Okay, bye. Bye. Hi, this is Paul Casey, the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame educational video series, where we'll be talking about a reflection of senior grandmaster Parker and his life with personal anecdotes and stories from his senior students. And uh, today we are very lucky to have senior master of the arts, Danny Ridardi. Mr. Ridardi, it's a pleasure to see you. Thank you very much for Likewise. coming here today. Well, uh, Glad to hear from you, my man. Uh, hope you're healthy and wealthy. Uh, other than that, I'm here to serve you, Paul. Anything okay. I can do for you. So let's ask some questions here. Mr. Ridardi, what was the first time you ever met Ed Parker? I met Ed Parker right uh, at the Internationals. That's when I, I met him right after the Internationals, and I decided uh, to leave the school I was uh, 
working out with for two years. And I says, uh, I'm going to Pasadena school. And I started there with Ed Parker in 1964. And you made black belt what year? Uh, five years later. Do you remember that ceremony? Oh, yes, quite. Uh, quite a couple. I also made a ceremony with Lima Lama, Tino Telegusega. Him and I uh, made uh, brown belt at the same time, same test. What was the ceremony? Can Tell us about, walk us through that ceremony. Well, it uh, consists of our, our, the basics. Naturally, uh, we didn't have the techniques that we had now. They were run, hadn't started yet, so uh, we went through the basics. And uh, I remember, recall one in, one of the black belts asked me for uh, how do you, what the middle finger fist was. And I was nervous at, at the time, and uh, <laughs> I, I stuck out my middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> and it hits the knuckle. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to have a closed fist and just have the knuckle. And that was the answer to the middle finger fist. But uh, again, nervous. Uh, we did our, our basics, which is the main thing in the art. It's the basics we start off with. And again, we have uh, the arm lock and certain grabs and holes. But uh, without the names, we, they didn't name off the names. But that's the way it was. What is the best lesson you ever learned from Ed Parker that still inspires you today? You know what you're worth, Dan. <laughs> that was the lesson. You know what you're worth as far as in the applying your knowledge or teaching your knowledge and uh, in, in business also. So I stayed with that as a lesson. What's Mr. Parker's personality like? Well, uh, he was uh, humorous and uh, he would also uh, make jokes on certain incidents that had happened to him. And uh, I thought that his humor was, uh, you know, happy, a happy person, always uh, either complimenting somebody and uh, making life uh, happy for everyone. Can you recall any funny stories? No, I mean, I wasn't living with him. It's it just some, you know, uh, it was strictly under training. And, but uh, again, he, he was the first, I never know what a known Hawaii until I met him. He took, he was on his way to Hawaii and asked me if I have been to Hawaii. I says, oh, no, I haven't. But I, I took the weekend and, took off to Hawaii with him and, and uh, since then I've been back about 12 times and even promoted uh, an event up there. Obviously your family is very, very close and family is everything to you. Love Absolutely. And, and the most important thing we have in this world is that moment, that precious moment that we can share with one another, that we can give each other love and caring. Yes. Ed Parker is told he can come down to see you right now. Comes down for just a minute or two. He walks in her. It's just you and Ed Parker. And he sits down next to you. Mr. Rodardi, what would you say to Ed Parker? How'd you do it? Come down and see me this time. But uh, there's no words. To, uh, sit right next to me. <laughs> Where could I probably be? How is it up there in heaven? But uh, I have no idea what the words would come into my mind. But uh, what could I tell them? Things have changed. As you well said in, in the arts of Kempo, it's just an art of learning. You always uh, strive to learn more than what you already know and uh, keep learning. As they say, smart people learn from everybody average people learn from experiences in, in their life stupid people have all the answers thank, thank you, you mr Ridardi. 
Thank you very much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. Take care. Hi, this is Paul Casey, the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame educational video series, where we'll be speaking with CJ Steve Muhammad, and we'll ask him questions about his life, martial arts, and finally, his personal reflections, some anecdotes and stories about his good friend, his instructor, the late senior grandmaster, Ed Minker. Hello, CJ. Welcome to the show. How you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. We're so happy to have you here. And I know that many of the people will love to hear some stories uh, of your incredible career in the martial arts. Uh, first of all, my first comment is, you look amazing. You look great. Life must be treating you well there. I have a beautiful wife that's taking care of me. God bless you, sir. And thank you for sharing that with us. Ed Parker's vision coming from the islands of Hawaii, training with, you know, uh, the greats from there. You can just, I mean, you look at all the heads of Kaji Kempo, Lima, Lama, Hawaiian, uh, Kwan, Shaolin, you know, Matosi's people, Chow's people, they're all one family. And he had the vision to come to America in the early 50s, which he did. And this one man opened the door for everybody to walk in, to be a part of it. If it wasn't for Ed Parker, I don't know any of us would know each one another. I probably the most influential in the modern arts uh, right now because of the opportunity of uh, bringing people together. And um, that was a common statement made by almost everyone I've spoken to from Chuck Sullivan, Danny Inasano, Dave Hebler, uh, Bob White. Um, they all are very excited to hear from you. So this is gonna be a very exciting interview and when I get this out. So you've met Ed Parker and, uh, and that was in, uh, at the school. How often did you interact with Mr. Parker? It, it wasn't a lot. I was invited out to Pasadena school sometime. Uh, but most of the time he would come over to the West LA, West LA school or something, and he would teach um, techniques of his teaching. But as far as me working with him personally and by myself, I never had that opportunity. I always, I was so impressed by his movements. And I used to tell everybody in the school, they used to laugh at me because I would say, man, I said, one day I'm gonna be able to move across the floor like he does in thunder. And you could hear the floor in the room shaking when he moved across the floor. I, I said, one day I'm gonna be able to do this. I, I can't remember, uh, what his name? Norman's, Norman Patty, I think his name was. But he says, Steve, how much do you weigh? I said about 165. I was probably that weight at the time. <laughs> he says, do you know how much Parker weighs? I said, no, what's it got to do with me being able to thunder across the floor? He says, maybe you gain about another 100 pounds. You might be, <laughs> might be able to do that. Parker weighs about 250. I said, he can't weigh that much because he... He was in excellent shape back in those days. And he had a white stripe on his head that I thought at one time that he actually had that put in his head, you know, to make him look different. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't, I'm trying not to laugh, you know. Oh, Mr. Parker, what an amazing individual. Very much so. Um, let's talk about Ed Parker. What was the greatest lesson he ever shared with you? He told me one day, he said, Steve, you're an excellent fighter. He says, take what I have given to you and your instructors have given to you and you make it your own. I thought, I said, what does he mean by that? Make it your own. He says, because you're not Ed Parker. You're not Danny and Asanto. You're not Chuck Sullivan. You can learn from us. 
but you you will never be us. So take what I've given to you and make it your own. And from that time, that is exactly what I did. I made everything that was given to me by all the instructors that I went to, I made it mine. I took from them what they gave to me and I put it into me. What was the greatest inspiration Ed Parker inspired you to do? In a tournament one day, he said, uh, he said, Steve, he says, I've seen this guy fight. He says, do this and do that and do this and do this against this guy. And he says, you will be, able, he's a good fighter. He said, you will be able to overcome him if you do what I tell you to do. And I got out there and I fought and I won and I came back. He looked at me, you know, Steve. I said, yes, Mr. Parker. He said, you did what I tell you to do, you know. And I didn't quite understand him. I thought he was telling me that I didn't do because of what he told me to do, I was doing it out there. I was trying to do exactly what he told me to do in dealing with this guy. And he said, Steve, it's amazing that when I give you information and tell you to do these things, he says, you go out there and do those things or either you attempt to do them he says, that's going to make you even a better fighter because you're able to take information from someone and actually actualize that information against an opponent. And that was one of the great things that I actually believe in you know, and, um, and understand what he was telling me was to take this and make it yours. It belongs to you now. We gave you the base or foundation now it is up to you to make it grow and to a science for fighting, not a style or a system, but a science. And that science, to my understanding, should be a mathematical science for fighting. That everything that comes into existence is through a mathematical code. So when you fight, it has to be a mathematical science. How was Mr. Parker's comedic side how was he as a person aside from the martial arts what was he like outside of the school mr parker was actually funny when you <laughs> I, <had an> <laughs> I like that answer explain please explain to us <laughs> he would say little funny things you know when you you're sitting around him and it's like he's sitting there and you're watching him and it's like he's coming up with little words he's going to say that is kind of funny to kind of entertain and make make everything you know because we're we're start we're talking about karate and what we can do and how we can fight and he comes up with something funny and i remember he had some sayings that i can't remember now but if you do this or do that you'll be pale well to the <laughs> to the earth I can't remember the words now, but he was telling you that if you don't use the science or learn the science of the direction in which you're going, then you can end, on, end up on the floor looking up. And I always thought, man, I'm never going to be the one to look up. I'm going to make somebody else look up. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I know you did that to many people, sir. Many, many people had that unfortunate experience with you, C. Joe. Did you ever visit Mr. Parker at his home? Yes, I went to his home. Yes. Sir. Did he I ever did. play the ukulele for you? No, he never played the ukulele for me, no sir. Yeah, he pulled that out. I was very fortunate a few years ago on his 81st, 85th birthday uh, the, that his daughters actually asked me to play his personal six string ukulele. And we did uh, a beautiful song reminiscent with a photo collage of I'll Remember You. And that was written by his classmate, Kui Lee. And so uh, I, that was very, I mean, it was a pretty big thing to play that in front of, oh, I don't know, 100, 100 black belts from Ed Parker's life in Costa Mesa. And, uh, but yeah, he caught us. Uh, I would go into Pasadena and uh, I'd be in this, and we go into the office, a sanctuary for Mr. Parker. 
because when he would come in, he would go there, lock the door and do his business. But he always had instruments in there, you know, and Frank Trejo uh, and I would, jam we do a jam session <laughs> in the office. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you right now, he caught us a few times doing that. And uh, he always liked to join in, but he was always in a hurry. So uh, anyway, so as you know, you, I, you know, obviously Mr. Parker was a very devout religious spiritual man and he family was most important. Two attributes that you embody very well. You're very humble. You're very genuine. Uh, you, it's obvious you have a beautiful family um, and that not only your personal family, but the extended family in the martial arts community that really cares about you, sir. And as you know, Parker cared a lot about people in a personal way. I'm going to give you a hypothetical, and you tell me what you feel. Ed Parker is given just a few moments to come down and spend with you, CJ. He's going to come in and sit down there with you right now. He's going to sit right across from you. What would you say to Mr. Parker? I would... I would tell him that I thank him for the science of fighting in which he gave to me through himself and his instructors. And it is something that I will carry with me until the day I die. And I thank him for that. See, Joe, thank you very much for your time today. It's been beautiful sharing this. You are an amazing individual. I look forward to spending quality time with you personally when it's convenient and uh, for the holidays, may the many blessings be for your family, for your children, and for those that you love. I thank you so very much, sir. And I'm honored to be able to be on your program today. And I thank you. God bless. Be safe. Uh, you too. Salute. <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. You too, Thank my you. brother. Thank you. Hi, this is Paul Casey, the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame. We are reflecting on the memory of Senior Grandmaster Edmund Kealoa Parker. And today our special guest is Senior Master of the Arts, Richard Huck Planis. Mr. Planis, welcome, and thank you for being part of the show. Well, it's always good to be here, Paul. So I'm going to ask you some questions today, sir, and I'd love to have your, your responses on it as we reflect on Mr. Parker's life 30 years after his passing. So with that, let's go rightly directly to you. Mr. Planis, how did you meet Ed Parker? Well, when I started taking Kempo, I was with Steve LeBound and Tom Kelly in uh, Fresno, California. And Steve used to put on a tournament uh, in Fresno uh, and he would invite uh, Mr. Parker up, you know, to be a special guest and all that. And we would have promotional dinners and uh, a little banquet type thing and hand out awards and promotional certificates and all that kind of stuff. And uh, that's where we say the old man, so we call him, you know, Mr. Parker came. And that's where I met him. And uh, it was funny, uh, Tom was there, Kelly, uh, both gone now. Uh, but... Uh, you know, they introduced me to Mr. Parker and said, this is uh, Richard Planis, we call him uh, Rich the Huck. It wasn't just Huck then, it was Rich the Huck, because I look like a Huck, if people know what that is. And Mr. Parker looked at me and laughed. He said, yeah, he looks like a Huck, doesn't he? You know, so that's how I met him and uh, from then on. What was your first impressions of Mr. Parker? Uh, I don't know. Uh, He just, he looked the part, I'll put it that way, you know, like uh, when they told me, you know, that they were under Ed Parker now, and I didn't know, you know, when most people just started taking karate, they don't know who's who in the zoo, so they told me they were under Ed Parker, I said, well, who's that, I don't know, you know, and he can bet him, I said, oh, yeah, he looks, he looks like he's a rough, tough character, you know, and that's, uh, 
man to be under, so that's what I heard. There are some videos on social media that show you working out with Ed Parker. You're wearing a white gi, he's wearing a black gi. Oh, okay. Reflect on that for us, Mr. Flannis. I think you're talking about the one that's behind the Pasadena studio. Sure. Uh, the lighting was better. I didn't even know who shot it, but that's when we were putting the system together. So we're just going through the techniques. And if you'll notice in one of the techniques, I think it was Gibson return, uh, the old man messes it up and then he shakes his head on, oh, that's wrong. And then it has to redo it, you know, because you know, it was all brand new stuff then, you know, but, uh, and that was uh, when we were putting the stuff together for Big Red, as they call it, you know, the training manual. Was that an exciting time in the Kempo world? Oh, well, everything was exciting back then, you know. You were young and dumb and, you know, just having a good time, you know. Uh, just it's where all your friends were and everybody, you know. Just, you met a lot of people life. during those sessions, correct? You a lot Oh, of yeah. A lot of people from around the world would come, you know. Uh, that's how I met most people, you know, a lot of Europeans, South Americans, you know, different places, Hawaiians. During your sessions at the Pasadena School training with Mr. Parker, you also went to some of his other schools with him, correct? Oh, yeah. Okay. Who, I'm told that you met or worked out with Elvis Presley. And Bruce Lee? Not Bruce, no. I knew Bruce. I met Bruce many times, but I never worked around. I wanted to, but never did. Uh, I just wanted to see if he was as fast as he looked, you know, uh, and standing in front of him, uh, but I'm sure he was. You know, I worked with a lot of people who did work with him, like Joe Lewis, you know, and a whole bunch of guys. But one thing that I remember, Dan and Asanto, I was in the Pasadena school and when I was first there and, and Dan was in, he came to, you'd come to visit the old man all the time. And uh, he yelled at me, the old man says, Huck, he said, come here, I want you to meet one of your countrymen. So I went in and, he said, and Dan says, oh, are you Filipino? I said, yeah, half. He said, you know any Kali or Screamer? I said, well, and I played with it, but you know, from my dad, but not a lot. And he jumps all over me. Man, you should know that's your head, that's your heritage, your blood, you know, and all this stuff. So I said, maybe you're right, you know. So I started going to Dan's and, you know, studying and stuff and, and became good friends ever since. And I've trained with Dan a lot since, you know. You saw Elvis Presley work out at the Ed Parker School. What was that no, like? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, they would come in after hours. And back during the old days uh, when Nizawa first brought out, Nizawa was one of the old Nizawa trading and his supply company brought out the body armor and stuff. It used to be illegal to wear that. They used to patch you down in the tournament. You had it on, you had to take it off. But when I came out, uh, you know, everybody liked it. And, and so they went out, Elvis, the guys, and went out and bought a bunch of that. And used to come in after hours on a stool and, you know, put it on and then beat the hell out of each other. So, you know. <coughs> I remember one time uh, before I went up to Elvis's house with the old man, I saw Harem scare him, you know, the, one of his old movies, and he, where he played a karate man. I says, man, I says, it looks like I was really laying those shot 10, you know? Well, so I got to ask him, you know, so we're up at the house, and I said, hey, Elvis, I said, I saw, I saw uh, Harem scare him the other night, and I said, it looks to me like you were really hitting these guys, and he starts laughing, yeah, man, he stopped with a lay on me, and he says, we went and got a bunch of that body armor, so I put it under those bare robes, they couldn't see it, he said, I was trying to kill him, he said, I was really putting him in, I said, yeah, it's good show, so you can see it, you know? That was funny. I'm gonna end with one last question for you. You know that Mr. Parker was a spiritual man, believed in God. He was a devout Mormon. He's given a chance to come down here to talk with people. And he walks into the room right now and spends about a minute or two with you. Right now, what would you say to Ed Parker before he had to go back? Well, that's hard for me to say right now, but let me tell you this. I visit with the old man a lot. I mean, I don't know what it is, but it's like dreams and, and where he comes to me and we talk about things, you know, and everything that's been going on and going on, what's happening here and there or whatever. And it's just real as can be, you know, it's just really, it, it gets to me sometimes, you know, uh, but I do that quite a bit. You know. 
Um, we, I said, we had a special relationship, you know. Uh, he called me his stateside island boy, you know, and it was like my daddy too, like a lot of the guys, you know. I, when I lived in the Pasadena school, he would come and pick me up on weekends and take me places and go here and there and whatever, go to house and church cookouts and all kinds of stuff, you know, and just, that's just the way it was. You know. Thank you very much for sharing those personal moments with, with us today. And I know Mr. Parker would be proud to hear this and he will hear it. God bless you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Hi, this is Paul Casey, the Campo Karate Hall of Fame. This is an interview with Mr. Uh, Solis, Louis Solis, Senior Master of the Arts in American Campo. Mr. Solis, please tell us the first time you met Ed Parker. Okay, the first time I met Ed was a long time ago. There was nobody in the studio but Ed and Jimmy Ebra. And uh, I was talking to Ed, and uh, just to make it short, at the end, I was telling him, Ed, when I make my 10 years, can I free tire with you? He turned around and looked at me, kind of left like that stupid, you know. That's what I remember. I'll never forget that day. Do you remember your first lesson with Ed Parker? Well, my first lesson actually was with Jimmy Ebra. When, when he was one of Ed Parker uh, Black Belt a long time ago. And uh, right now, I'm talking about it, Ebra died not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ed Parker was, was talking to me, you know, and he said somebody came in, so he told him, so he about to start me off on a, you know, on the on the workout. Now remember, it was so hard, I was about ready to quit. He, he, he was, he, he pushed you and make you get down in the horse and stuff, and you know, and he was like, uh, kick the legs out of you, <laughs> but he made it hard. And I said, no, man. I'm quitting. I'm never coming back. And a couple of days later, I came back again to talk to Parker. And, and uh, well, that's when I told him, but well, yeah, after 10 years, because he told me he, was, he made it black belt in 10 years. So I said, well, when I get my 10 years, could I black, could I freak out with you? And, and he said, he, 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 he turned, he's kind of give you that little smile. And, and I think, too bad, you know. And that was the first thing. I can never forget that day. Can you tell us what it was like training in Pasadena? When did you first start? When I first came in, Steve Parker was in the late 50s. That's when everything began. Um, I remember there was nobody in the studio but Ed Parker and um, Jim Ebra. And then Parker was talking to uh, some people and stuff until he wanted to get me started. Uh, and he he would made it so hard on me. He, he was like he, he let the thought my leg would would could be open like a, you know, because he was kicking them out, spreading them along, and oh man, that was painful. And I said, oh man, I'm gonna quit. I'm not gonna stay here. And uh, so the, the, that day ended, and I, a couple of days later I came back, and then Parker gave me Jimmy Ebro again. And I told him, man, they were, they were hurting me, you know, that time. And he started laughing, Parker was laughing, so what, Ebra. But then I got used to it, I guess, and I started training with Ed Parker, started coming in every day. Now, now Ed Parker taught me a couple of times, but he usually was busy with people. And he had another guy from Hawaii that, that was a friend of him. That guy was uh, fantastic. He, was, he could jump in the air, kick. He took all those things really good, you know. He was really a freestyler. And, I, he, and he taught me for a while. So I had Jimmy, he brought the guy, and Ed Parker uh, were teaching me. Tell us about the day you were promoted as a black belt. Oh, God, I can't even remember that. It was so long. I, I think I was a white belt for a long time. And when he... Oh, when they promoted me to black, 
don't remember, he did for Mummy too, but I could do, but nobody did for art school and art studio. And uh, he gave me a kick, but not, he didn't put everything into it. He, he didn't yet to make me feel it that I got it. Morning yesterday, he lined up the guy that was working out and had him all watch, and he put me, I called me up in front. And that's when he told me to get down in the horse, take my belt off. And then he kicked me. You know, it's about, that's about the size of it. And then all the guys shake my hand and stuff. And uh, that's about it, like what I said with you. Do you still have that belt? I might have it. I have got them put, so many different belts. They all put it right someplace. He takes care of all my stuff, you know. Beautiful. So I might still have my first track. In your days of training in Pasadena. Yes. You had an experience of training or working out with Bruce Lee. Oh, Tell us the story about Bruce Lee. Okay. But he came into the studio and I was there talking to some guys and there was other black belts over there talking and uh, and he came up to me and talked to me and he wanna, uh, how could I say it? Oh, I, he wanted me to come with him and do a demonstration and stuff. And I told him I wasn't very good at that. There's all black belts up there, they know more about it than I do. And he told me, no, you're like my people, I like you. And and I want you to come and do it with me. And I said, okay. Now, when I went, I, I, I did uh, some techniques that I can't remember which ones they were, but I remember he talked to me and he, uh, I was dummy for him. You know, he did the takes me out behind me and dropped me and hit me. And, and he did that one, one inch punch, boom, boom, me. And he grabbed you and have it in your fist. So I remember all that. So after that, he, uh, it became friendly and we had went to dinner. Do you so remember I, the last thing you said to him? To Bruce Lee. Well, we went, came back for another demonstration. And uh, Dick Bolin came with me. Because uh, he wanted to go and see me. So he, uh, he talked to Bruce, to Bruce Lee. And then we, me and Bruce, uh, Steve did a demonstration, and it seemed like they all liked it, you know. And we did a, a short form. I can't remember which one it was. But the last thing, of, I think we were in his hotel. But you had a good relationship with him. Oh, yeah. You were friends? Real friends, yeah. And he liked me when he always see me laugh, you know, because like saying, I, I caught him, you know, and uh, nobody else ever said anything to him. They was ready to talk to him. What was the most important lesson you learned in about life from Ed Parker? You know, uh, uh, Parker was, uh, they were religious. Uh, they were, you know, and I, I, I don't think I ever heard Parker cut and say things like that and stuff. And, now you talk to Parker like if we did every other day, you know. Hey, hi, hi. Uh, usually I call him Ed. I didn't. I didn't call him Parker. I call him Ed all the time. And he, he called me Louie, so that was it, you know. You know, sometimes we took it. We on. I, yes, I went with him on a lot of demonstration, and I forgot about that. But there was hardly nobody with us, you know. It, his school wasn't that big. There was uh, like. Seemed like I was with him all the time. And uh, I used to take him to, to uh, get stuff for the school. He used to, oh, he, I remember he took me one time. He was mad. And, he, and I thought it was going to be a big fight or something. So he took me and he went into this bar. And there was a lot of guys from Hawaii in there. And Parker came up. And I don't know. They spoke in Hawaiian. So I don't know what they were saying, but Parker was mad. Then he said, this is Louie. He's one of my students. And everybody looked at me and they bowed to me. And I, I just shook their hands, you know. That was uh, one time, when I, uh, the first time I seen him so mad. I thought he was going to really have a fight there. And I was kind of scared. <laughs> so that was one of the experiences I had with him. Did you ever see him engage in a fight? No, not engage in no fight, no. But I see him mad, in, uh, but not, he never 
he said the, he controlled himself. He got so mad, but he just, you know, and then he called me Louis that dog man tried to making me mad. But what could I do? What was your impression of Mr. Parker when you watched him on the mat? He was good. I mean, I was actually every time I seen him, he used to do a, a technique with a bunch of the black belts from other schools. You mentioned them on their names, but they were way ahead of me in rank. So they used to one guy used to throw straight throw a jump kick at him, and he parries him real fast. And with parrying him fast, he went over to the sides on, on the floor, and he dropped three guys that on a, on a demonstration like that. He, he didn't hurt him, but he did hit him. Do you remember working out with Dave Hebler and Chuck Sullivan and 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 any of the Rich Montgomery and any of the young guys? Uh, Dave Hebler, we I did. He was ahead of me. So he was like an instructor to me, mm -hmm. and when I worked out with him to, when I first started. But but I can't remember too much. Uh, I can't remember too much of those guys anymore. That's okay. Whatever you don't understand right now. If you don't remember, just ignore that part and just say whatever you feel, okay? It's all right. I'll edit some of this down, so it's not a big deal. Uh, it's important, though, that whatever you do know, you want to share, okay? What was your relationship with, say, Frank Trejo? Oh, when I first met Trejo, he was uh, yet coming into the studio with uh, Danny in the studio when he had his school. And I used to teach for it, Danny in the studio, and it's not... Danny and Asanto, and I also taught Wyatt Parker. So I was running back and forth to schools, and Frank Trejo kind of took over the schools. And at first, I was I had Frank, I, I had the uh, Frank Trejo come with us on a demonstration for a school, and he, and he liked that. And also, we went on a demonstration for uh, um, some club they had up there, where after the demonstration, they they gave us food and stuff we ate and, and beer. Those are a couple of times with with uh, Frank Trejo. Then on, I think Frank Trejo took over the school, and I used to come on teaching. I didn't spend too much time with Frank Trejo because I was running back and forth. And then later on, when Frank Trejo took over the Ed Parker School, then I got to see him more as a friend. And um, we was pretty close to uh, pretty close and stuff like that. But then after a while, I went away. No, then when I went to Spain, and I came back about a month and a half ago, later on, and I, and I, I can't remember too much when I see him, but he already had control of the school in Pasadena, so I used to go there with him and talk to him all the time, you know. And sometimes I used to teach a class, and some of the classes I taught uh, for him one time, uh, uh, his name... Uh, Zach was in that class. He wanted to be in it. And Zach said that was the hardest class he ever had. You know, he couldn't believe I could do all that stuff. So I did a lot of stuff. For, and, and I can't remember all the things. It's okay. Last question, because my battery's dying. Yeah. Mr. Parker, we both know, has passed. Mm -hmm. And eventually we'll all see him at one time in our life, in the future. Yeah. When it comes to that time when God calls us. Mr. Parker is going to be here with us in spirit. Because this is the 30th anniversary of his passing. Mm -hmm. And in spirit, he's going to walk into this room here now. Ed Parker walks in here. You have only a minute to talk to him. What would you say to Ed Parker right now before he leaves? I think I said, God, 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 Ed, I'm glad to see you. I'd like to see you again, Mary. Maybe I'll meet you pretty soon. That's about it, I guess. Because my time is coming pretty soon. I already had a couple of heart attacks, and, and I got this thing that runs for, that can, they control the blood that's going to my heart. So I don't know how much longer I got. Mr. Solis, thank you from the bottom of my heart, and for all the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame members and those that have watched this, thank you for sharing these moments with us. We really appreciate you. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for talking to me.
Hi, this is Paul Casey, the Campo Karate Hall of Fame. Today, it's reflections of Senior Grandmaster Edmund Kealoa Parker. And our special guest today is Senior Grandmaster Ted Sumner. Ted, welcome to the show. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to ask you a few questions about your relationship with Ed Parker. As you know, this is the 30th anniversary of his passing. So we're going to look back at Mr. Parker's influence in Kempo, and especially in your life from your personal opinion. Sir, when was the first time you met Ed Parker? Well, uh, he came to, came, used to come up to San Jose to teach class um, every couple of months. But the first time I really uh, got to meet him, work with him, was when I uh, was 15. Uh, we were having a um, promotions banquet that evening. And he came up, and I was going to be in the demonstration with him, uh, me and my training partner. And he came up, he taught the class, and then he spent the rest of the day. He taught uh, each of us one side of the two-man set and then taught each of us three techniques to do in the demonstration. Um, it was then that I got to actually feel Ed Parker when he, when he demonstrated the technique on me. I mean, you knew, you knew something was happening there, you know. And um, so I actually learned two-man set directly from him, uh, plus the three techniques that he taught us. Uh, and then we were in, in the demonstration with him that evening. What was the most important lesson you learned from Ed Parker in your martial arts journey? I'll, I'll tell you, um, I was 15 years old. I was, I was a green belt getting my brown belt that night. And he took me and my training partner, Rick Harper, and he worked with us for, for a good five and a half hours the rest of the day. When I asked him a question, and I'm a 15-year-old kid, I'm a green belt, he stopped, he considered everything I said. He made me feel like I was not just important, but the most important person in the world at that moment. And that is a skill that makes you not only listen to what that person has to say, but with great admiration and reverence for what they say. Uh, that was an incredible ability he had to take an insignificant green belt and make him feel that important. I remember the last time you saw Ed Parker? Do <laughs> you really want this story? <laughs> yes, sir. I was at John Sepulveda's school, and he was there teaching, uh, teaching a seminar. And he had some pictures. He was signing pictures. And, and, uh, and he and Al Tracy at the time, many people thought they were on the outs. Uh, according to Al, I mean, they talked at least once a week on the phone. But I... I went up and said hi, and he said, hey, I haven't seen you in a long time. And I said, I want to get a picture. Um, I said, you know, I've got a, a new girlfriend. Her name's Alicia, and she just loves you. You know, could you sign it to Alicia with love from Ed? And he said, sure. And I said, well, as he was starting, I said, well, you know, we call her Al. Could you to just sign it to Al with love from Ed? And I was going to give it to Al Tracy, but Ed caught on to what I was doing, and <laughs> he didn't think it was as funny as I did. <laughs> With that in mind, Mr. Parker, as you know, was a devout Mormon, and he believed in God. He, ble he believed, more importantly, the goodness in people and the goodness that was in his heart. He was a human being. If Mr. Parker were to sit down right now with you, sir, in your room for just a minute or two before he had to go back, what would you say to him, Ted? Well, I would thank him for everything that he gave us. Um, I, I would thank him for Kempo, the way he passed it on to us, um, the way he made it the preeminent martial art in, in at least North America, but pretty much in Europe as well. Um, how he gave us a moral compass and a direction um, that that has been taken up by, by a number of other people. But more importantly, there are questions I would want to ask him. Um, what was his inspiration for doing this? I know he never made a lot of money, you know, but yet he was considered uh, such a significant individual. Um, we have a tendency in our society to judge people by 
how much money they make. Um, and yet a friend of mine once said, well, you know, if money was that important, why would God let evil people have so much of it? Uh, what, you know, I would want to know, how is it, what kept him going? What, what drove him to do, and, and you said he was a human, I'll go even further, he was a humanist. He cared about his fellow man, and he cared about his art, and he cared about what the art did for people, and how it could help people. What was his motivation? How did he get up every day and keep going? Thank you, Ted. Hi, this is Paul Casey, the Campbell Karate Hall of Fame educational video series. And it is our reflections of Senior Grandmaster Ed Parker. Today, our special guest is one of the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame members, Senior Master of the Arts, Tony Martinez Sr. Mr. Martinez uh, has been involved in the Kempo practice for many, many years and was one of Mr. Parker's good friends. Welcome, Mr. Martinez, to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, it, it's an honor to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about your background in the Kempo world? Okay, I, I started back in 1959 with Mr. Parker and Mills Crenshaw. There was a studio there on 8 South on Main Street, which uh, had been opened up. I had a couple of friends with me was in the boxing field because I was boxing two years prior to that. To that. Yeah. I, uh, Mr. Parker asked me to, to throw a couple punches at him and I could no way get near him. He said, he told me this directly. I want you to block everything I can throw at you. Three times in a row, I could not block him. And I couldn't believe it. I was overwhelmed. And within a week, I signed up with him. My manager in, in, in the boxing field was upset because I had switched over to him. So that's what started. I was overwhelmed. I, uh, I was so amazed with his, his, it was Mr. Parker, the, Mr. Crenshaw. But you know, at that time, uh, Paul, uh, I was told that Mills Crenshaw was the first Caucasian that, that they put in. Also, also at that time, there was a, a, a teen, uh, it was about 15, 14 or 15, uh, 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 Casey, uh, Casey Clayton. He was the first black belt at that time under Mr. Parker that they, at that time, there was no uh, teens available at that, that year, that time of the year. It was all adults. So this is kind of a new thing to him. So I, I stayed with Mr. Parker all that time. He was going to the BYU. Also, I was over amazed with Mr. Parker and Mills Crenshaw when they were doing their fencing, which probably no one actually knew about it. But I was, I was impressed what they can actually do. So this, was, this is part of it, what really went on the greatest lesson that Mr. Parker ever taught you? And it's not related just to martial arts, but a life lesson. I asked Mr. Parker, Parker, how do you have so much power? All he told me, he says, it will come in time and you will realize it. But it took me a while to figure out what he was trying to tell me. He was trying to tell me, he took he did two things. He Remember this, Tony. Remember a point of origin, always. And I do remember it to, not to this day. And also your linear moves and horizontal moves, you learn to drop your weight. And with the point of origin, you will notice the power coming to you. And I practiced it over and over for years. It took a while for me to catch on to that. And now I notice now over the years, I have actually doubled my power from this point on to this time now. And I can see what he meant. That's a lot of times at that time, Casey, Mr. Parker would do techniques only by the ABC system by one, two, three. And a lot of the techniques are now are over five or six, seven moves. Um, but uh, I, I went back to the old way that Mr. Parker did it. I, I follow this program and I still continue the program. I, I teach my black belt all the, the old ways that Mr. Parker 
had given me. But I also showed them the one, two, three system of how Mr. Parker emphasized on power, accuracy, and in, in, in target area. See, that's what you gotta do. So, uh, relaxation of your body. I've learned that, and I'm uh, still now at my age, I'm smart, from my black, most of my black balls, I'm still faster than them. Why? Because I've mastered the point of origin and relaxation in my body. We both know Mr. Parker was a devout Mormon, very spiritual, a, a great human being and cared a lot about people. He showed that with kindness and his handshake. He always introduced himself as Ed Parker. And I'm gonna ask the big guy for a second to ask Mr. Parker to come down here. This is a hypothetical for you. Mr. Parker comes into your room right there. He sits across from you, Tony. What would you talk to Ed Parker about for just a minute or two before he has to go back? Well, Mr. Parker, I will tell you, I'm so thrilled that I met you. I wish I had met you sooner because I know I could have. The knowledge you even gave me on the private lessons I did went down to Pasadena. You gave me a private lessons. I, I, I would learn, I learned more in your one private lesson and taking six months from another person. That's how much knowledge you gave me and, and explained to me in detail. I was over impressed what he had given to me in a short amount of time. I'll never ever forget Mr. Parker. I hope I'd answer that for you. Sir, you did. It was a truly an honor to talk to you. Thank you. Many blessings for you and your family for the holidays. And I truly look forward to seeing you in the near future. God bless you. I sure do. God bless you. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Hi everyone, this is Paul Casey, the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame, uh, educational video series. And we are now reflecting on Senior Grandmaster Parker, the creator of American Kempo, founder of American Kempo, and many other amazing things in his life. And as we reflect on it, we will be talking to uh, the people that are very important to us, those that were know knew him well, we're very close as senior students. And today I'm very honored and privileged to have Dr. Carl Totten. Dr. Tot is one of the most important individuals in the martial arts, not because of just his amazing talents, but his education, his experiences, and the way he presents the martial arts as a life journey. And we are going to ask him some questions today about his friend, his teacher, Ed Parker. Hello, Dr. Totten. Hi, Thank Paul. Thank you for coming on. Happy to be here. I really appreciate what you do for the martial arts world. It's great. You're, you're an amazing man. Uh, anybody that were ever to look at your bio and read up on you would say, wow. How did you get that all in one lifetime and you're still cold, <laughs> right? I always tell people I, I feel like the luckiest guy on earth because I've had amazing teachers like Mr. Parker. Can you tell us uh, right from the beginning, how did you meet Ed Parker? You know, I'm sure I met Ed Parker back, probably back in the 60s at his internationals when I started going to the internationals. You know, I started Kempo uh, in 1963. I was actually training uh, with a man named John Leoning, a senior student of Imperato in Kaju Kempo, which is a kind of a branch of, uh, of Kenpo, you might say. And of course he knew uh, Ed Parker. And so back in the 60s, when I'd go to the internationals, you know, Mr. Parker would be there. And I was also heavily involved in Kung Fu because John Leoning had studied Kung Fu with people like Ark Wong. And so I was Ark Wong's student also. And of course, Ark Wong knew Mr. Parker very well. In fact, Ark Wong demonstrated at Ed Parker's first internationals in 64, the one where Bruce Lee 
was discovered, you know, by most martial artists. And so, you know, all along, I kind of knew uh, Mr. Parker. He was kind of like my, my uncle, you might say, in martial arts. And then one of my very close friends, uh, and I'm sure you know him, it was Dr. Ron Chappelle, a uh, very close uh, uh, student and friend of Mr. Parker. He kind of took me under his wing and shared a lot about Ed Parker's Kempel with me from the 60s until today, really. And he's the one who really uh, closely introduced me to Ed Parker to, uh, to the point where Mr. Parker, you know, gave me his number and told me to call him anytime. And then I started regularly going to Mr. Parker's house for private lessons for several years. Can you tell me, you were a student of Ed Parker. What was it like to have a lesson with Ed Parker? <laughs> Always amazing, because you never knew what he was going to say or do, but you knew it'd be good. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think I ever met anyone quite as smart as Ed Parker in the martial arts. I mean, the man was a genius several times over. And when he would speak, he would use the terms terminology of a mathematician and a physicist and there aren't too many martial artists who talk like that but Mr. Parker did when he was explaining Kempo when he was explaining the you know the keys of Kempo you know the alphabet of motion uh, the keys to movement you know he, he would use terminology that came from math and physics in order to illustrate and explain using analogies what he was trying to get across and then he, of course, he'd get up and demonstrate it on you, and then you'd get a sore. <laughs> you know. Did he ever but, practice on you? Oh, all the time. You know, because you know he he talk about a, a principle, uh, you know, one of the key master keys, and then of course he demonstrated on me. You know, until until I got into my thick skull, until I understood what he was saying, <laughs> and so he had to beat it into me a lot of times before I actually fully got it. <laughs> What was the most inspirational lesson you learned from Ed Parker? You know, uh, Mr. Parker and I, besides all of those lessons, we went out all the time. You know, Mr. Parker loved to eat. I'd take him to uh, Chinatown. I, you know, we'd go to local Pasadena restaurants sometimes. I'd take him shopping, you know, to the big men, big men stores where he, so he could buy clothes. I, I, I even took him out to a, uh, a gun store. He bought a Mac 10, <laughs> you know, but you know what impressed me most about Mr. Parker was his kindness, the way he treated people, the way he made you feel every time you were in his presence, like you were the only person in, in the world. And he, he would just take you into his world and into his amazing brain and just share unselfishly. That impressed me even more than his unbelievable skill was how kind and sharing a human being he was. He truly was a very spiritual person. Did you ever hear him play the ukulele? Oh, yes. Tell us about <laughs> Beautiful. that. Beautiful. Yeah, he, he would play and he'd sing. You know, he, he loved to just kind of kick back and, and just be natural and casual. And when he was at a, a, a venue where he could do that, you know, he, he'd love to just pull that out. And, you know, he, he had, he played beautifully, you know, he sang beautifully, you know, you know, with his, uh, you know, Hawaiian accent. And I thought it was just lovely. <laughs> That's funny. I remember at his 81st birthday, they had it at Costa Mesa and uh, all his daughters there. Before, yes. You know, I was there and I was very lucky uh, that Beth and Darlene let me play his six string ukulele and I sang, I'll remember you. Yes. And the reason I chose that song was twofold. One, it was reflective of him and everybody that was in the room. And two, it was because his classmate, Kui Lee wrote that song. Wow. Ed Parker comes into your room right now. He's only got a couple minutes to spend with you, Dr. Cotton. He's going to sit right in front of you. You're going to look him straight in the face. 
Tell me what you will say to that man. Uh, number one, I am so grateful. Thank you. I love you. I will always love you. You changed my life. You changed the world. You, you taught martial artists how to think, Mr. Parker. And because before that, it was all just physical. You know, you truly combined the scholar and the warrior. And I, I hope to, you know, honor you by continuing that tradition, you know, as long as I'm here, you know, to train and to teach. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. That's what I would say to Mr. Parker. Thank you, Dr. Totten. It was beautiful. I appreciate you. your time. What a beautiful, fitting tribute to a man that you love. You're Thank amazing, you. Dr. Totten. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope that uh, the blessings of tomorrow resonate and, 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 and that energy still flows all over you, that positive energy. God bless we have, you. We have a lot to be grateful for. Thank you, Paul. We do, sir. Yes, we do. I'm grateful for your friendship. Thank you much. You have a great night. Anytime. Take care. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Paul Casey, the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame educational video series, where we'll be talking about and reflecting on Senior Grandmaster Parker, the founder of American Kempo. Today, we are so privileged and honored to have an individual whose contributions are unquestionable. He's legendary in the martial arts world. He was a close personal friend of Mr. Parker, a student of Mr. Parker, worked with the Kempo system most of his life, has gone on to create incredible accomplishments which you welcome to the show sensei benny yukitas benny it's good to see you thank you so much for coming on uh my pleasure Paul. I actually is uh thanks for having me on you know because uh it's it's truly a pleasure uh, to talk about you know one of my you know one of my heroes so let's start from the top benny when did you get into the martial arts and what was your first system of, of martial arts you studied well, you know, my uh, my father was a professional boxer and my mother was a professional wrestler. Now, how they got together, heck if I know. But at the age of three, when kids had fire trucks, I had boxing gloves. So I was actually fighting at five years old, Pee Wee Division boxing. So in 58, I was already in combat, uh, working boxing. And then in, uh, then I started in late 16, at least 50, 59, close to 60, I started judo. And I started judo and I, uh, I got my third degree in judo. And then I started uh, uh, Kimpo Karate. Uh, and that was with uh, Mr. Uh, Bill Ozaki. He was my first sensei in, in, in that form of uh, martial arts of uh, Kimpo. And so I started, <laughs> especially with Sensei Bill, uh, I was just one of those wild kids that just had a lot of, you know, I just had a lot of fight in me, you know. Uh, the fight was really not the fight. To me, it was like playing, you know, I was just like in a romper room or something, just playing. And um, people will call it, ah, you're a good fighter. I said, I was just having a good time playing, you know, and I really was. It, I took nothing personal and... Um, it's just something that was so natural. So when I started, uh, I started Kempo Karate and in 64, just one year later uh, uh, at, at the internationals. And so I first went there and got there. It was to a point where, uh, okay, in 64, um, I went to the internationals and my brother, my brother Arnold, and there, there's uh, actually, there's nine black belts in my family. And so my brother Arnold is the oldest and he trained all of us. Well, he started with the Sensei Birozaki and we all just kind of follow him. And my, my brother Ruben and Smiley, and they, they were actually in judo. And, and they went up north and they were in judo. 
And so that's why I started doing judo. And so I was boxing, period division, and doing judo. So in, by the time uh, 64 came in the internationals, I went and I was actually hurting a lot of the kids. I was making them cry because I was already a good boxer. And I, was, uh, I, just loved the, I just loved the fight game. And I was hitting these kids in the body and stuff like that, making them cry. And all the parents were complaining to uh, since if, uh, Parker was, uh, they were saying, I don't want my son to fight with him. And so they were complaining to him about I was hurting the kid. I was making him cry. And so, so Mr. Parker would go, you, come here. What's your name? I said, and I put my head down. I said, I, I, I didn't know what he was going to do. But I just put my head down and I said, my name is uh, Benny Sensei. And he said, look it, this is martial arts. This is about control. This is about technique. This is about being able to go out there and be quick and get in and get out, but not hitting hard, but with nice control. And I said, he said, you understand? And I, I shook my head, yes. And then he said, then he would look at the parents and they said, okay. And the parents said, okay. And then he would turn, he would grab me by the shoulder and turn around and he would, and he would actually put his thumbs up and go. And I looked at him and I was confused because he just finished tell, you know, <laughs> telling me, don't hit hard, don't do this and this and that. And then a sudden the, the parents leave and he grabbed me by the shoulder and turned me the other way and he would put thumbs up. And I didn't understand at that time, can I, can I go and do what I was doing or what do I do? I think, so I would go to my mother because my mother was very spiritual. You know, and she's Native American, so she, so I used to tell her, you know, Mr. Parker's told me this, what, what does that mean? And so she would tell me in her vision of what she thought. So she said, I'd like to, I like to meet Mr. Parker. I said, okay. He said, invite him. And so I invited him for, for Sunday, uh, and he came over to our house. And we, you know, we all sat down, my brother and just now we all sat down and had um, a brunch. And Mr. Parker, now that man can eat. <laughs> I mean, you know, this, this one can put down some food. So, and, uh, and so he was talking and my mother and him were talking philosophy, uh, a spiritual type of, and they really hit it off really well. And so um, Mr. Parker, and so my mom said, now I understand who he is. He says, he's a very strong, very powerful spiritual man. Train with him. My mother wanted me to train with him. So, Benny, what is the greatest lesson that Ed Parker ever gave you? Mentally, he had taught me to fall down seven times, to rise up eight taught me to not give up on myself, to not give up on my love for what I do mentally. He had taught me. Okay? Physically, I was already a strong warrior. Okay? But he taught me, go beyond the pain of what you're feeling and bring out the brilliance of yourself physically and what you came here to do. And then spiritually, he had taught me, don't forget what you came in to do. As my wife would say, forget what you know, remember what you've forgotten. What you know is what you've been taught by others. What you have forgotten is your brilliance coming into this world. This is puts it all in one with Mr. Parker. You met Mr. Parker as a young man. You were very impressionable at the time. You asked him for guidance. He took you under his arm as a father figure. What do you think Mr. Parker's greatest inspiration was to the martial arts? I think at the Nationals, basically, because it was fresh, it was right in the moment, it was in the now. When he, anytime he put his arm around me, I knew he had something insightful that would mean something to me 
that it was meant for me, just for me. It was personal when he would put his arm around me and whisper in my ear. And, and he whispered many things in my ears. And some I will not share with, but some I've shared with you. You're a very spiritual man. You're very grounded. You're secure in your own way. Your path is clear. And you're showing people that path and encourage them to walk it too. We both know Mr. Parker was a devout religious man. He believed in God. He believed in many important things. He asked to come on down here for just a few moments. And he walks into your house right now. He's sitting right in front of you, Benny. Just in a few words, what would you say to Ed Parker today? I would say, Mr. Parker, let's sit down and break bread together because you had taught me and my mom had taught me when you're sitting down breaking bread together, you are sharing with each other, not food for just your stomach, for your physical, but you're sharing food for your mind with one another, what you've done, what you learned, what you're passing to one another. He taught me, and I would say, Mr. Parker, thank you for breaking bread with me. Thank you for breaking bread mentally, physically, spiritually. Thank you that I have this time that I can look into your eyes and your truth and your laughter and your smile of your strength and power all at one time. You taught me on the table, most of all, how it's so important, eh? And it wasn't the last supper. It was the first supper that when we first, when he first came and had meal uh, on a Sunday with my family, it was the first and it was never the last. It was the first and it will always be the first. So every time we sit down and if you would, you know, I said, Mr. Parker, you're here again as the first, as the first time you sat down, this is the first. And I thank you that you will take the time to come and break bread with me and my family because you became my family and we became family ever since then. His family became my family. My family became his family. We became his one. That's what I believe in my heart, my mind, my soul. My belief system is more stronger than any of my faith. Because why? I have a knowing. And this is what I say, Mr. Parker, thank you for breaking bread with me. Thank you, Benny. Thank you for sharing such personal thoughts, stories, and more importantly, how you truly feel. You're a wonderful human being that is very gifted in ways that can't even be described. Many blessings to you, your wife, your family. You're amazing. Before we leave, I just want to say for all of you that are watching, all of you that are hearing, and all of you that are feeling, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and the most important of all, Happy Journeys. And we will begin with that. Before we go any further, I would like to take a moment to welcome, welcome a very special guest. I've grown to really admire him as a human being. He is one of the people that is amazing. Uh, he has a path that he's chosen and his talent speaks volumes. I've been very fortunate to ask him to do some things for me, and I am humbled by his work. His talent is amazing, but what's more important is the spirit that lives within him. So, the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame today is going to focus 
right now on Edmund Parker Jr. Hello, Ed. Welcome. Are you here? We have you unmuted. Yeah, I'm unmuted now. Oh, God bless you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I know that you're, you're, you have so many projects and whatnot, and uh, I'm really grateful that you would come on here and say hello to everybody because they all are our friends. We're all part of that big family, and every time I've had a conversation with you, sir, it's always been re very rewarding. So I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs> <laughs> you like that? How was that for a segue? Yeah. That... <laughs> okay. Well, um, I, I guess I'm late for the party because I've never seen one of these before. So, I, in fact, this is the second time I've been on Zoom. We're on Zoom for church this morning. So we just figured out the Zoom button. Um, anyway, I recognize a number of faces here. I grew up with a lot of you guys, and uh, it's nice to see uh, – you guys are all aging well. As you can see, so am I. Um, no longer the little kid that ran around the internationals. Um, not at all. Um, anyway, uh, I, I don't know what else to say other than the fact that it's, it's nice to see that you guys are keeping my dad's flame alive and adding uh, to it your own um, passion and um, energy into this, into this uh, community and the industry. Uh, it's an it's an honor to have been um, influenced by a lot of you. Uh, I've taken lessons from some of you and and, and uh, definitely been around. Um, uh, you know, community most of my life. Uh, I I left the Los Angeles area and I, I live in the middle of nowhere. Um, the only thing that'll attack us out here is uh, moose and deer, maybe a mountain lion, but no need for Kempo up here. Just uh, um, just a great place to write uh, books and uh, do artwork and you know so it's nice to see a lot of your faces and uh, uh, thank you for uh, honoring my father and uh, keeping his legacy alive and uh, putting your own stamp on it um, you know all we can do is be influenced by our teachers and you know we have to stand on our own two feet and do our own thing and uh, I'm glad to see that uh, that's what's going on anyway um, there's your salute. Thank you, Ed. The Before time we back go any further, would you introduce your wife? We've oh. seen so many videos and photos with her. And, you know, she, the energy between the two is is so good. Uh, why don't you take a moment and just have her come on over for a second? Hello, honey. How are you? Hi. I'm it's well. so good to Thank you. <laughs> we just, you know, I have to say in all the posts that you have up there with you and your husband, it is so optimistic, so positive. It's a breath of fresh air because usually social media is a cesspool. <laughs> I don't have to explain that to any of any of the people that are here. We all know what we're dealing with, but it's more obvious now in our agendas. And um, grateful for you and your husband for taking this time. It really means a lot uh, to the Kempo family that... Um, you're a part of it, and we welcome you, and we're glad you're you're there with him. And uh, she actually knew my dad for the Christmas year. <laughs> she actually knew my dad back back in 1975 when we first met. Um, her family was adopted by my family back when when they were um, still teenagers. And um, anybody remember my friend Chubbs? He was always at the internationals. Uh, it's his cousin, so. Uh, this is my wife, Bear. Bear, can you tell us what was it like meeting Ed's father? Oh, he would. He was warm and loving. He, our family had carte blanche in their home. Um, Ed Senior let us park our Volkswagen Bug on their hill so that we could jump start it, <laughs> pop the clutch. He, he loved us like his own, so. How was he at his personality as his comic side, his fun side? Gosh. <laughs> well, we were teenagers. So um, he was a little scary because we were always doing pranks. 
we were always getting in trouble. So um, it was a little scary. There was once I, I was hiding in Ed Jr.'s uh, closet. <laughs> well, he got in trouble downstairs, which was fun. But with the Bear Kids, he, he never gave us heck. So it was great. Yeah. Were you ever privy to him playing the ukulele and singing? I didn't hear that. I, I didn't know that side. Okay. Unfortunately, I wish I had. I, it was class, a blessing he, to hear him. He was in the same um, college program as my father at the same time. And my father was a professional musician. So, you know, I heard a lot about his musical abilities. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Parker. We appreciate you coming on. God bless you. Uh, continue to post those wonderful photos that you guys take. Thank They're you. great. I, I see that. And Edmund, I know you have lots of, uh, a lot of projects coming up. I encourage people to reach out to you if there's something of interest. You know, you guys can- I'm no different than my dad. My dad taught me to, to stay busy at all times. And, and, you know, if he was still alive today, there'd probably be another 40 books printed and published. So, um, you know, I'm working on my own series of books right now, uh, along with my wife. And, uh, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree in terms of work. And, you know, we just, you know, get busy living or get busy dying. And I don't believe in death yet. So <laughs> we are honored. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you, uh, you sharing that uh, with us. That means a lot. I come to you with only karate, empty hands. I have no weapons, but should I be forced to defend myself, my principles or my honor should be a matter of life or death or right or wrong, then here are my weapons, karate, my empty hands. I come to you with only karate, empty hands. I have no weapons, but should I be forced to defend myself, my principles or my honor? Should it be a matter of life or death, of right or wrong, then here are my weapons, karate, my empty hands. I come to you with only karate, empty hands. I have no weapons, but should I be forced to defend myself, my principles, or my honor? Should it be a matter of life or death, of right or wrong, then here are my weapons. Karate, my empty hands. I come to you with only karate, empty hands. I have no weapons. But should I be forced to defend myself, my principles, or my honor, should it be a matter of life or death, of right or wrong, then here are my weapons. Karate, my empty hands. I come to you with only karate, my empty hand. I have no weapon. Should I be forced to defend myself, my principles, or my honor? Should it be a matter of life or death, right or wrong? To hear my weapon karate in my empty hand. I come to you with only karate, empty hand. I have no weapons, but should I be forced to defend myself, my principles, or my honor? Should it be a matter of life or death? of right or wrong, then here are my weapons, karate, my empty hands. I come to you with only karate, empty hands. I have no weapons, but should I be forced to defend myself, my principles, or my honor? Should it be a matter of life or death, of right or wrong, then here are my weapons, karate, my empty hands. I come to you with only karate, empty hands. I have no weapons, but should I be forced to defend myself, my principles, or my honor? Should it be a matter of life or death, of right or wrong? Then here are my weapons, karate, my empty hands. I come to you with only karate, empty hands. I have no weapons, but should I be forced to defend myself, my principles, or my honor? 
should it be a matter of life or death, right or wrong, then here are my weapons, karate, and my empty hands. I come to you with only karate, the end. I have no weapons, but should I be forced to defend myself, my principles of my honor, should it be a matter of life or death, right or wrong, I come to you with only karate, empty hands. I have no weapons, but should I be forced to defend myself, my principles, or my honor, should it be a matter of life or death, of right or wrong, then here are my weapons, karate, my empty hands. I come to you with only karate, empty hands. I have no weapons, but should I be forced to defend myself, my principles or my honor, should it be a matter of life or death, of right or wrong, then here are my weapons, karate, my empty hands.